الحمد للہ القائل وقل جاء الحق و زہق الباطل ان الباطل كان زہوقا ونشهد ان لا الہ الا اللہ وحده لا شریک له ونشهد ان سیدنا و نبینا و مولانا محمدا رسول اللہ بلغ الرسالة فلم يقصر فيها وأدى الأمانة فكان خير مؤديها وكشف الغمة ونصح الأمة فتركها على محجة بيضاء ليلها كنهارها لا يزيغ عنها إلا هالك فصلى الله وسلم عليه وزاده فضلا وشرفا لديه وصلى على الآل والأصحاب والتابعين لهم بإحسان وبعد فيقول الله عز وجل وما كان المؤمنون لينفروا كافة فلولا نفر من كل فرقة منهم طائفة ليتفقهوا في الدين ولينذروا قومهم إذا رجعوا إليهم لعلهم يحذرون صدق الله العظيم In the time of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم the greatest need of the hour was jihad against those who would see Islam as an enemy. Those kuffar of Mecca and of the surrounding Arabian tribes were from time to time attack Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If it wasn't Badr then it was Uhud. If it wasn't Uhud then it was Ahzab. Every now and then there would be attacks launched on Islam, on the house of Islam, which was Medina at the time. So at that time, one can understand very, very clearly why I would say that the most important need of the hour was jihad fi sabilillah. But even at a time like that, Allah Ta'ala says, وَمَا كَانَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لِيَنْفِرُوا كَافَ Even at a time like that, there had to be some people who would stay behind in Medina, while others would go forth and make jihad fi sabilillah, so that those who stay behind can gain an understanding of their deen. فَلَوْلَا نَفَرَ مِنْ كُلِّ فِرْقَةٍ مِّنْهُمْ طَائِفَةٍ لِيَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينِ Everyone should not go out. There should be those who stay behind to gain an understanding of their deen. And why must they gain that understanding of their deen? And that understanding is not restricted to how to make salah, and how to go for hajj, and how to give our zakah. Every aspect of our deen. There had to be those who would do so. وَلِيُنْذِرُوا قَوْمَهُمْ إِذَا رَجَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ In order that they can be in a position to warn the others who spend their time in serving deen in other ways. But those equipped with understanding of deen who will be able then to convey the warning to those who do not know it. لَعَلَّهُمْ يَحْذَرُونَ In order that they also can take heed. This is the reason why we have come together. Our reason there are many other needs out there in society. But everyone is not required for every need. There are those who will acquire to certain needs. Many of us sitting here on a Monday night, on other nights of the, of the week we are busy elsewhere. On other days of the week we are, do, we, we are filling important uh, other posts elsewhere, all of which contribute to this particular deen of ours and its well-being. However, we have set aside this time. This hour, hour and a half to two hours, we've set it aside. For which reason? لِيُنْذِرُوا قَوْمَهُمْ إِذَا رَجَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَحْذَرُونَ In order that we can be in a position to take this knowledge that we have, convey it to others that they do not, do not fall into the same pitfalls and traps that others have fallen into before. This is part of our mission, of our duty as Muslims. To preserve our deen, whatever it might take. And if it means that there will be criticism, well, then whatever Sheikh has said before me applies. For tonight, however, there are several topics which we wish to cover. I have, however, been given very strict instructions. One hour, nothing more. I must only speak for one hour, and after one hour we'll have question and answers for about 15 minutes, and then we will uh, terminate on that. So without any further ado, inshallah, let's get into our topics. What are those topics? Four topics that we want to look at. Four issues. The first issue is dialogue. Is there a need for dialogue and where is that need for dialogue? Secondly, unity. These are issues which will be brought up from time to time. Whenever people discuss this particular gathering of ours now, be it on the radio or be it in private gatherings, it will be said that this is against the interest of unity. There should rather be dialogue. We say, yes, very, very right, very correct. There has to be a uh, dialogue. We will locate the dialogue where it's supposed to be. Secondly, the issue of unity. 
the unity of this ummah is extremely important, but unity does not, uh, it's not that important that we sacrifice everything else for the sake of that unity. Unity goes with a number of preconditions. We will start looking into some of those preconditions, and then we will quickly survey history to see whether those who called for unity in the past, whether they had actually given everything whether they were prepared to sacrifice everything at the altar of unity or not. Then there are two other topics related, and we'll see how they interrelate. The next topic is, the Shia are nothing but another madhab. We have a Shafi'i madhab, a Hanafi madhab, Hanbali madhab, Maliki madhab. So there's just another fifth madhab, it's called the Ja'afari madhab. They, they practice in a certain way, we practice in a certain way, there's no harm. We we'll look at that question. We will investigate whether Shiism can be assimilated along with the rest of the madhahib with a broad stroke of the pen as simple as this is just another madhab. It's just a Jafari madhab, nothing more than that. Is that true or not? You will hear this as you go along. We we'll look whether it, how true it is. Lastly, the, the great appeal of the Shia would be they say that they are the ones who follow the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They are the ones who follow the imams from the Ahlul Bayt while everyone else is following imams from, any, from somewhere else. They are the only ones who remain true and love the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whatever they have in terms of their fiqh, in terms of their interpretation of their Quran, in terms of their ahadith, all of this come from the Ahlul Bayt. The center in Ottery is also called the Ahlul Bayt Foundation of South Africa. We will investigate, for as much as time allows, the link between the Shia and the Ahlul Bayt. When they make a claim to loving and following the Ahlul Bayt, how true is that claim? Let's go back to the first of our four points, dialogue. Dialogue is very important. It's extremely important that people of differing views have to come together, speak about their issues, discover where the mutual differences lie, look for ways to overcome those differences so that things can go forward. However, there's something that comes before dialogue. This country of ours should know it better than anyone else. We have had many, many years of an oppressive system. 1994 did not simply mean that all the excesses and all the oppression and all the abuses of the past are forgiven, it's over. There was a process we had to go through. It was a painful process. For many it was an extremely painful process, but it was that catharsis that was needed to, in order to take things forward. That was the truth and reconciliation. Um, the issue of truth and reconciliation. We had the TRC. The TRC played a very, very important role. Those who were wrong had to come up and say, I admit and I acknowledge it. I was guilty of this and I was guilty of that. And then it can be said, yes, you are forgiven. In Islam it works in exactly the same way. You cannot simply commit a sin and then go on living without making tawbah. Tawbah means, first of all, acknowledge the crime that you had committed. Admit where you were wrong and then from there, the process of reconciliation with Allah Ta'ala will start. We live in a time of admissions and acknowledgements. If you have been looking at the papers recently, I'm not speaking about Sheikh Irfan in the paper last week. I'm speaking about something else. If you've been looking in the papers recently, you would have noticed Gordon Brown is speaking about apologizing for all those little kids that they took away from their families and sent down to, down under Australia many, many years ago. Before that, the Catholic Church asked forgiveness of the Jewish people for all the harms that they would inflicted on them in the past. And from time to time, people will come forward, institutions will come forward, governments will come forward and say that we have done wrong, we ask for forgiveness. There are two specific instances where people haven't asked for forgiveness. Those two instances more or less took place at the same time, at more or less the same time. We are speaking about the 16th century, the 1500s and the 1600s. Two great calamities occurred, and both of them occurred to Islam. The one occurred in the east, and the other one occurred in the west. In the west, the Iberian Peninsula, you and I would know it better as Spain and Portugal. Land ruled by Muslims for 800 years. 
And after 800 years, what happened? There came the Reconquista. The Spanish Christians were reconquering the land. Islam was weak, scattered, divided amongst themselves. So it was merely a matter of time before all of Spain was reconquered. And those Muslims who remained in Spain, what happened to them? Gradually, over a period of 200 years, they were all forcibly converted to Catholicism. No one asked for forgiveness for that yet. In fact, go to the Spanish today, they will tell you it was a very good thing that happened. Why was it a very good thing? Because it led to national solidarity. Everyone follows the same religion. We can't have two religions operating side by side. Force them into Christianity. But we will have one religion, one religion only. The amount of blood that was shed, the amount of people that were forcibly converted, well, that's collateral damage. At the same time as this was taking place, in the West, something else was taking place in the land of Persia. We know it better today as Iran. 80% of the Muslims of Persia were, Mus- were Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah. At exactly the same time as the Spanish were converting those Muslims to Catholicism, the, the new Shi'i rulers of Iran went on a campaign to convert those Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah people to the Shia. They did it, first of all, by removing the leaders of society. The ulama were either killed or sent into exile. Had to run away into exile. And gradually thereafter, year by year, the Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah left leaderless would be converted through a process of force by using the sword. By coercion, there would be no one asked for forgiveness for that yet. As the Iranians today, they say it was needed. Why? Because we needed national solidarity. We can, cannot have two religions operating side by side. So the result is today that 80% if not 90% of Iran today is a Shia land. And the Ahlu Sunnah that were there once upon a time, no one is asking for forgiveness for that. But things go back further than that. That wasn't the first excess. That wasn't the first abuse of the Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah that occurred in history. The first abuse is that abuse which up to the present day is being hurled against whom? The Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Those about whom Allah ta'ala said radiallahu anhum wa radu'an, there will still be those today who would say what? That no, they were out of the fold of Islam. They became murtad after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for reasons we looked at before. We're not going to go into them in detail for now. But I would like to recall something, just one little incident that happened to Ali ibn al-Hussein Zain al-Abidin, the fourth of those whom the Shia count as their imams. As far as we are concerned, these were not imams of the Shia. These were great pious, learned men from amongst the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa but the imams of the Shia, they were not. As we will see later on, much of what today purports to be Shiism are things that were ascribed falsely to the imams of the Ahlul Bayt afterwards. But more about that later. I just want to look at one particular incident. A person from Iraq comes, and most of the Shia in those days were in Iraq. And the imams of the Ahlul Bayt at that time were living in Medina. And it was a time long before modern tele- telecommunications. So, from time to time, people from Iraq come to Medina. Some of them come and meet these great figures from amongst the Ahlul Bayt. And some of them would go to the extent of putting in front of them, you know what, this is what we have heard. Is this true? So a person comes, and he comes to Imam Zain al-Abidin and he says that, he starts speaking ill about the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, about the Muhajirun and the Ansar. Imam Zain al-Abidin sits and listens to him. After the person speaks, he tells the person, I want to ask you a few questions. The person says, by all means, go ahead. He starts reading to him. لِلْفُقَرَاءِ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ الَّذِينَ أُخْرِجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ وَأَمْوَالِهِمْ يَبْتَغُونَ فَضْلًا مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرِضْوَانًا وَيَنْصُرُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ أُولَيْكَ هُمُ الصَّادِقُونَ As a person, you know this ayah? He says, yes. Now, what does it mean? Allah Ta'ala is speaking about the distribution of booty. That was captured not by war, when the enemy fled. That kind of booty captured is called fay. So this fay, to whom must it be distributed? Allah Ta'ala says to the muhajireen. But he doesn't simply say the muhajireen, he describes who are the muhajireen thereafter. Al-fuqara al-muhajireen, al-ladheena ukhriju min diyarihim. Those who were cast out of their homes, driven out of their homes, and the properties that they had in Makkah, they were forced to go into exile. أُخْرِجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ وَمْوَالِ يَبْتَغُونَ فَضْلًا مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرِضْوَانَ Only one reason made them leave their homes. Because they were looking for the pleasure of Allah. 
They were looking for the grace and the pleasure of Allah. وَيَنْصُرُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ And where they went, they were the right hands of Allah and His Rasul. They were those who would assist Allah's deen, assist the deen of His Rasul, stand, stand with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa This is how Allah Ta'ala speaks about the muhajireen. أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الصَّادِقُونَ such people are the truthful ones. So Imam Zain al-Abidin reads this entire ayah to the person. The person says, yes, I know the ayah. He says, no, that's not what I want to ask you. I want to ask you, are you one of them? The person says, no. He says, okay, fine, you have admitted you are not one of them. So listen to the next ayah. وَالَّذِينَ تَبَوَّأُ الدَّارَ وَالْإِيمَانَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ يُحِبُّونَ مَنْ هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَا يَجِدُونَ فِي صُدُورِهِمْ حَاجَةً مِمَّا أُوتُوا وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصَةً وَمَنْ يُوقَ شُحَّ نَفْسِهِ فَأُولَئِكَ هُمْ الْمُفْلِحُونَ There's a second group I want to ask you about. And they are these ones. Those Tabawa Dara wal Iman, they inhabited, they prepared the homes and iman even from before they were awaiting the muhajirin who would make hijrah to them. يُحِبُّونَ مَنْ هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِمْ They have love in their hearts for the muhajirin who would come to them. وَلَا يَجِدُونَ فِي صُدُورِهِمْ حَاجَةً مِمَّا أُوتُوا What Allah has given them, they have no need for it in their hearts, they are prepared to share with the muhajir brother. وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصَةً They are prepared, they give preference to others over themselves, even though they themselves are in need. Such people, Allah Ta'ala says, وَمَنْ يُوقَ شُحَّ نَفْسِهِ The person who is protected against the greed of his own heart, فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ مُفْلِحُونَ Such are indeed the successful ones. So Imam Zain al-Abidin asks this person, Tell me, O person from Iraq, are you one of these people that Allah Ta'ala has spoken about here? He says, no, I'm not one of them. So he says now, you yourself have said that you're not one of the, muha- the, 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 the muhajireen. You have admitted that you're not one of the muha- ansar. I tell you, you are not one of these who come next. وَالَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ After the muhajireen and the ansar, there will be Muslims to come till the end of time still. This ayah tells us what attitude we are supposed to adopt towards the muhajireen and the ansar. Those who come after the muhajireen and the ansar, what is the attitude? يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَا بِالْإِيمَانِ The Sahaba رضي الله عنهم were humans. They were not Anbiya. They had made mistakes. They could make mistakes and they had made mistakes. They were not Malaika. They were not Anbiya. When they make a mistake, what do you and I do? Do we till the end of time say, do you know what so-and-so sahabi did here? Let me tell you what he did there. Do we write thick books telling people that Khalid ibn al-Walid is no sword of Allah, he's the crippled sword of the devil? Is this the kind of things that uh, attitude we are supposed to adopt? Allah Ta'ala says, no. What is the attitude? وَالَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِن بَعْدِهِمْ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا If you come after the muhajir and the ansar, the first thing, don't look at them, look at yourself, رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا Oh Allah, forgive me. I am weak. I am a human. I make mistakes. After you have asked Allah Ta'ala for your own forgiveness, وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَا بِالْإِيمَانِ And those brothers of ours who preceded, the, uh, who preceded us in Iman, those who laid the foundations of this deen upon which we are standing today, those on account of whom we can be carriers of the kalima, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. When we look at them, and we find out, and we hear that anyone has done something wrong, what do you do next? You say, Allah, forgive them. Forgive them for whatever they had done wrong. وَلَا تَجْعَلْ فِي قُلُوبِنَا غِلًّا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Ya Allah, do not place hatred in our hearts against those people who have iman. Those people who have iman, who are those? Those first two, first two categories. You want to know who are those who have iman? إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَالَّذِينَ هَاجَرُوا وَجَاهَدُوا بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَنفُسِهِمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَالَّذِينَ آوَوْا وَنَصَرُوا أُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ حَقَّا Who are the true mu'min? Those who made hijrah in the path of Allah and gave up their homes and those who made nusrah, who received them the ansar, you want to see a mu'min? That is the true mu'min Allah Ta'ala says. So make istighfar for them. On the other hand, this is now what we are supposed to have. This is how Allah Ta'ala instructs us 
the attitude that we are supposed to adopt towards the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. On the other hand, we find people who have made a religion out of hatred of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, who are prepared to say that they are, they are men like we are. And they made mistakes, therefore they must be condemned for their mistakes, as anyone today must be condemned for his mistake. And then you'll find all these kind of statements, some of which we are even too shy to speak about in this masjid. So dialogue, certainly they're they're supposed to be dialogue. We must have dialogue. But where must this dialogue be? The dialogue must start from an admission that there's something very, very wrong. Where is there something very, very wrong? Not within the house of the Ahlu Sunnah, within the house of the Shia themselves. The Shia themselves have drifted far, far away from what the Qur'an teaches. The Shia have instituted, institutionalized for themselves a sunnah of their own making, as we will see later on, and they've made it on par with the Qur'an. They say they have the Qur'an, which they have drifted away from. They have the sunnah, which they've made themselves. This is where the admission has to start. Dialogue will have to start from within the house of the Shia themselves. There's a need for dialogue. I spoke to you some time ago about the case of Muhammad Hussein Fadlallah, Shi Alim of Lebanon, who was prepared to acknowledge the fact that that version of history, which the Shia have, which tells of how Umar attacked the house of Fatima, is not true. That's, what, that's where dialogue is supposed to have been. What happened to him? Fatwas of Kufr were given against him. Because he was prepared to review, he was prepared to revisit issues and acknowledge that certain things are wrong. There are several other ulama of the Shia who were prepared to come forward and say that, look, everything is not in order in our house. The reason that is causing disunity between ourselves and Ahlu Sunnah is not because the Ahlu Sunnah have followed someone, we have followed someone else, we have imams and they have imams. No, the true reason is there's something very wrong within the Shia themselves. The Shia themselves have a version of interpretation of the Qur'an which is at variance with that of the Ahlu Sunnah for reasons which some of their own ulama say we have to get away from that now. The Shia have problems with the way that they view history. They themselves have to start discussing. The kind of disquiet, the kind of, what shall I call it, that has been in the airwaves now for the past few weeks, ever, ever since we launched this, problem, uh, this program. Ever since we, we launched this program, things have been said. The radios are a buzz. Everyone is speaking about it. And we are, it is being said that Sunnis and Shias must come together and they must speak. We are very, very prepared to discuss with the Shia. On condition that the Shia start discussing amongst himself, first of all. Ahmad al-Katib. Ahmad al-Katib is an Iraqi who fled Iraq in the early 80s, went to Iran. Long story, I'm going to cut it very, very short. He started investigating for purposes of his own the entire idea of imama. He investigated it in light of the Shia scriptures themselves. He found out eventually his research leads him to the position that this imama, which we've been speaking of for the past few weeks, which is the essential bone of contention between the Ahlul Sunnah and the Shia, the imams of the Ahlul Bayt never believed in anything of the kind. This was something that was made up afterwards. And if there is any, ever any hope for the Shia and Ahlul Sunnah to come together, and to have dialogue, they will first have to distance themselves from ideas such as these. The result of this has been, Ahmad al katib had to flee Iran, is living in England. So whenever there is someone who comes forward and says that, look, let's be honest and admit, then the result is what? That person is shouted down. That person is condemned. So there is a need for debate, or for, for dialogue. A very, very great need for dialogue exists. But that dialogue has to start within the house of Shiism. When they get the house in order, then we are very prepared to come together with them and then start discussing it from there onwards. Why is there that lack of preparedness to engage in that kind of dialogue? Because if you have a huge wall standing, and that wall goes 20, 30 bricks high, you cannot simply start taking away bricks from the lower rows, what will start happening? If you start taking away a brick here and a brick there, eventually the entire wall will come down crashing. When you start revisiting certain issues within Shiism, and you come to the conclusion that perhaps this was not what the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt ever taught, what's going to happen? It's not just going to be that one little issue. If you say, for example, if you say that, look, this whole idea of tahrif of the Qur'an, interpolation with the Qur'an, that certain ayat were changed. Many of the ulama in the, of the Shia stated it very, very clearly in the past. They stated that this Qur'an had been changed by the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. 
All accolades to those ulama of the Shia who are prepared to say that, no, we don't believe in this. But we don't want it to stop there. It's not as simple as saying, I don't believe in tahrif. It's not enough to say that such and such a scholar doesn't believe in tahrif. It must go one step beyond that. It must go to the extent, if you can have 2,000 narrations, 2,000 Shia hadith that say that the Quran was changed, then you can have the same amount of a hadith forged by the Shia themselves to say that there's something called imama. Mullah Baqir Majlisi was the greatest Shia scholar of the Safavid era. He says that the amount of a hadith of, on tahrif, there are so many, that if you can deny tahrif, you can deny imama as well. Imama rests upon a hadith of the Shia. Tahrif rests upon a hadith of the Shia. If they are prepared to reject the one, they must reject the other together with it. Those who are prepared to come for dialogue today, they say, we'll come for dialogue. We don't believe in tahrif and we don't curse the sahaba. But these are those very, very central bricks that when pulled out of a structure, the entire structure is going to come down. So, for dialogue, to have dialogue is not just enough to say, I don't believe in X, I don't believe in Y or Z. It's the entire package to, together. Everything must be taken as one integrated passage where parts are inseparable from one another. If you prepare to reject the one part, anything connected with that part also comes tumbling down. These are the preconditions to any dialogue aimed towards unity. Then we can have unity. We can have unity then if the Shia have revisited these issues amongst themselves and admitted that these things are not even part of Islam in the first place. They will find, like Ahmad Al-Katib found, like Nawab Mahdi Ali Khan from India found, like Musa Al-Musawi, the Shia scholar found, all of them, they've investigated issues, these things are not, they, they, they do not belong to Islam. So we must get rid of them. If you get rid of them, get rid of them completely, all together, and thereafter, udkhulu fi silmi kafa. Then you enter this religion of Islam completely without any hang-ups that come to you from the outside. This brings us next to the issue of unity. Unity of the Muslim Ummah is something that lies grounded in ayat of the Quran, very clear in which Allah Ta'ala says, إِنَّ هَذِهِ أُمَّتُكُمْ أُمَّةً وَاحِدَةً وَأَنَا رَبُّكُمْ فَعْبُدُونَ that this ummah of, our, of yours, this is one ummah. You must stand together. وَاعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا All of these things are in place. We are supposed to have unity, but at any cost? No. If that kind of unity will lead to us failing to achieve some of our other objectives, then that unity is not a good unity. We have to be able to separate two things. We have to to be able today to separate the interests of the Muslim Ummah on the international arena, on the international stage, and the interests of this community here in Cape Town right now. What counts up there on the international stage does not necessarily have to be reflected down here. And what's important here does not necessarily have to be reflected up there. We have to be able to separate these two. You've heard the question was asked some time ago, that, you know, what we are doing now, and Obama's speech some time ago, and where does it all lead to? No, this is Cape Town, and we are sitting with a particular problem, which we are looking for ways to deal with. And what's happening in the, at the international level? I would go to the extent of saying that, if it is a matter between America and Iran, and nuclear power, and all of those other things, there I don't think any Muslim needs to stand back and say, no, the Iranians must not have nuclear power. Any state that wishes to have nuclear power, and is responsible enough to know how to use it, should be able to have it. No one should be able to dictate to another, you can't have it and you can have it, because there's a huge imbalance in the world right now. If Israel can have nuclear power, why cannot others? So as far as international matters are concerned, there by all means, what we are doing here does not mean that the Iranians cannot develop nuclear power. It does not mean that the Americans are correct in what they are calling for. But we should be able to separate that from what's happening down here. Iran has been calling for Muslim unity ever since 1979. But have they for a single moment desisted from doing things that are directly contrary to that very unity which they are calling for? Not for a single moment has, has that happened. Why? Because they are very, very capable of separating the international issue from the local issue. They say, yes, in the international level we want to have unity with everyone else. 
they themselves have been the ones sending missions all over the Muslim world. If they have been able to separate the two, then I think we also can separate the two. Unity is something important. We need to have it. We the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah were the ones who realized very, very long ago that when the Crusaders marched in our, into our lands, in the 11th, 12th centuries, and the Crusades started, seven Crusades, one over the, after the other, over a period of how many? Of 200 years, from 1095 to 1291, seven Crusades were launched. We were the ones who realized, under the leadership of Imaduddin Zangi, thereafter Hassan Nuruddin, thereafter the great Sultan Salahuddin al Ayyubi, we were the ones who realized that in unity will lie the strength of the Muslim Ummah. It was on account of that unity that the Crusaders were defeated at Hittin. We realized unity, we have to have unity. On the other hand, the Shia, brief survey of the history. Brief survey. The first great calamity to strike the world of Islam was the fall of Baghdad. In that fall of Baghdad, the Shia were complicit in that fall of Baghdad. It was Khaja Nasiruddin Tusi who brought Hulagu to the gates of Baghdad. It was the Shi'i Prime Minister of the Khalifa, Ibn al-Alqami, who opened the doors for them to enter. Both these gentlemen were dreaming of bringing down the Sunni Khilafah and replacing it with a Shi'i Imama. Where was unity at the time? Bringing the enemy from the outside and thereafter taking advantage of the situation when every other city was ransacked and raised to the ground, when Muslim blood was flowing copiously, when the Tigris was running red with the blood of, the blood of Muslims and black with the dissolving ink of, of books that were thrown into it, one city went spared. And that was the city of Hilla where the ulama of the Shia were. Why? Special treatment was given to them. They weren't touched. And immediately thereafter, immediately thereafter, they started on a campaign of conversion. Ibn al-Mutahhar al-Hilli, the student of Nasiruddin Tusi, wrote a book immediately thereafter. Manhaj al-Karama. A book aimed at what? Aimed at converting the Ahlul Sunnah to the Shia. So when these great calamities befell the Muslim world, what did the Shia do? Take advantage thereof. That was the first fall of Baghdad, the second fall of Baghdad, not too long ago, exactly the same thing again. If unity of the Muslim world was all important, then who is a Muslim? Is Saddam the Muslim or was Bush the Muslim? But the Shia hand was in the hand of Bush, and Saddam was regarded as the enemy. Where was unity at the time? Then it was the very, very regional interests that were more important. 1924, another great calamity struck the Muslim world, and that was what? The fall of the Khilafah. The Khilafah fell in 1924. We haven't had a Khilafah ever since. Even though that Khilafah, the last Khilafah of Sultan Abdul Hamid II, was a very, very far cry of the original Khilafah of Abu Bakr and Umar, but it was still the remnants of a Khilafah. When that Khilafah fell, fell, then the unity of the Muslim, that little bit of precarious unity that remained within the center of the Muslim world, all the Arab states more or less were part of the Ottoman uh, uh, empire, when the Ottoman Empire crumbled, who took advantage of the situation? Again the Shia. Again the Shia took advantage, and in what kind of ways? Those that have been around and have been reading and picking up a book or two will probably recognize when I speak about the, the title of a certain book. This book is called al Muraja'at. It has been translated into English under the title The Right Path. The author of this book is someone called Abdul Hussein Sharafuddin. He's a Shia alim from Lebanon. This person publishes a book. The book is a series of correspondences between himself and he claims the Shaykh al-Azhar of the time, Shaykh Salim al-Bishri. In this book, the Shi'i and the Sunni, they're having a discussion. Two great ulama, the Shia alim and the Sunni alim, having this discussion, debating the issue of the Shia versus Ahlu Sunnah. To cut this long story very, very short, it ends where Salim al-Bishri says that, I admit that your madhab is the correct one, mine is not the correct one. And he embraces the Shi'i madhab. Up to today, this book is held up as an example of what? As an example of how people are supposed to conduct debates. Look at the Sunni alim. The, the Shaykh of al-Azhar in his time, having a very, very uh, honorable, a very... Uh, uh, in a very very uh, low tone not shouting and screaming and ranting and raving evidence from this side evidence from the other side eventual acceptance by the Shaykh al-Azhar you are upon haq, we are upon batil 
That is the way the book appears. Now listen to a few other facts about the book. This book claims to have been, the author claims that these events took place in 1911. 1911 he claims they take place. The book is published 1936. 25 years later, he comes with the book and says, you know, 25 years ago, myself and the Sheikh Al-Azhar at the time, we had correspondence of this nature. And, you know, at the end I was able to convince him and he came over. It is 25 years later, but very importantly, 20 years after the death of Sheikh Salim al-Bishri. 20 years after the man has passed away already, you come forward with a book and you say, no, back then me and this man, we debated and debated and there it is in front of you now. And he admitted the fact that I'm upon Baathil and you are upon Haq. Curiously, in this book, the author, he claims to be writing in 1911. He is able to quote books with page and volume numbers of editions that wouldn't appear for 10 more years. Books that were, would be published 10 years, 20 years later, he is able to quote it in 1911 already. He is using a very classical argument. What kind of argument? The straw man argument. You want to have a debate? You make your own little straw man. Or take a puppet, take a sock and put, throw it over your hands. And then you talk to the sock and the sock talks back to you. And you tell the sock something and the sock says something else. And eventually you convince the sock and the sock also says, you are right and I am wrong. This is the kind, this is the kind of literature that is being spread about. You create your own opponent and you make him lose. That was night. Now, why is the book published in 1936, 25 years after the supposed event and 20 years after the death of the Sheikh Al-Azhar? For very obvious reasons. The Sheikh Al-Azhar is gone. He can't answer for himself any longer. But more importantly, had such a book been published in 1911, the Dawla Uthmaniya, the Ottoman Empire, was still strong at the time. No one would have been able to take advantage of it. A book like this would never have been allowed to be published at a time like that. But the moment the central authority of the Ahlul Sunnah went, books like this came out, this book has been extremely powerful in convincing people, both ulama and awam, ulama and common people, that the Shia upon Haq, why? They look at it, they read it, but they don't have a critical eye. They, they couldn't see the fact that, you know, 1911, 36, there's a huge gap. And there's much more to be said about a book like this as well. A similar book, a similar encounter takes place in another book. It's called Peshawar Nights. A Shia alim from Iran called Sultan al a Shirazi. He says, I traveled to, to Peshawar. Peshawar is a city in Pakistan. Back then it used to be India. This supposedly takes place in 1927. In 1927, he says, and for 12 nights I debated with the ulama of Peshawar, and eventually I vanquished them all. I defeated them all in debate. And then he comes back to, uh, to Iran afterwards, and years later he would publish this book on how I defeated the ulama of the Ahlul Sunnah. Once again, we find a person like him, 1927, he is able to quote from at tarikh al-Kabir of Imam Bukhari, 16 years before the book is published. And now, you and I are supposed to believe that this is how dialogue will take place. We are supposed to believe that this is how unity will be achieved. Certain other books of the Shia that are out there, books such as Then I Was Guided and so on, are basically in terms of the arguments, in terms of the adillah, the ahadith and the ayat used in there, they are basically carbon copies of what comes from al murajat So whatever can be said about the al murajat will apply here as well. What we find is that for the sake of unity, nothing ever stood in the way of the Shia when it comes to their own personal interests. When it comes to their own personal interests, why was a book like this written? Because at that time the need was to spread the Shia ideas. How, uh, how successful were they? In the, in the first half of the 20th century, in the first half of the 20th century, the land of Iraq was 60% Sunni, 40% Shi'i. Right now it's the other way around. On account of what? On account of the relentless campaign at conversion that they had been involved in from the early days already, from the days when the Murajaat was written, whether it is 1911 or 1936, but they were working, gradually working, going to the tribes out there, converting them, and gradually coming to a point where the scales would be tipped in the favor of the other. So now it's 60% Shia, 40% Ahlu Sunnah. We also find ourselves in a unique situation. What are we? We are a minority. A minority, this is also one of the remnants of the years of colonialism. Forefathers abroad from somewhere else, they came here, now we're living here as a minority. What are we? 1%, 2%, whatever we happen to be. But we don't have the kind of power. 
political power that will say we will not allow Shia missionaries to operate in our society. So what happens? What happens is that they will come. If you go to the website of the Ahlul Bayt Foundation of South Africa, is www.afosa.org.za. You go there, there's, an, a, there's a page called the About Us page. Look on that page and they will mention what are the objectives. One of those objectives is to have the counter-argument, convince people in order thereby gradually to, gradually to increase the amount of converse to Shiism. It's there on the website. And in the paper, Monan Aftab Haider tells everyone, we have not embarked upon a campaign of conversion. If you have not embarked upon a campaign of conversion, how come practically 100% of the people who are attending that center and have converted to Shiism once upon a time or, or were born as Sunnis? Why did they go over? Because someone gave them an idea. Someone gave them an idea. So when we look at the issue of dialogue, when we look at the issue of, of unity, we find that even the Shia themselves are prepared to say that unity, but there's going to be certain preconditions. When it's our own local interests, then un- unity must take uh, second, uh, must play second fiddle. Our own local interests come first. So, while one remains committed to the ideal of unity in the Muslim world at large, that ideal we do not allow it to blind us to certain other realities which are taking place at the same time. We come to the issue next of this thing called the Ja'fari Madhab. Our brother who stood up one night here and said, oh, well, what are Shias all about? All that they do is they make salah on a clippy. They put a little stone in front of them, make salah. They put their heads on a stone, we put our heads on a carpet. What's the difference? Someone will see a Shia making salah, he holds his hands by his side. And uh, Sunni, Maliki, Hanafi, Shafi'i, or rather, Shafi'i, Maliki, not Maliki, I'm sorry. Shafi'i, Hanafi, and Hanbali, they fold their hands. The Malikis also keep their hands by the side. So a Shia, I mean, he's just praying a bit differently. Sunni madhabs also pray differently from one another. How valid is the claim like this? It seems very, very persuasive when looked at like that. Well, they have a madhab and we have a madhab. They have their fiqh and we have our fiqh. So is there a difference or is there no difference? There are very, very serious and deep differences. First of all, what is a madhab? A madhab is basically a methodology. A methodology through which you approach the Quran and the Sunnah in order to draw the law of fiqh out of there. You apply it in a particular way, that particular system you apply it in one way, you get a madhab out of it. You get, you apply the Shafi'i methodology, you're going to get the Shafi'i madhab out of it. You apply the Hanafi methodology, it's going to differ in a few masail, the Hanafi madhab is going to come out of it. What are those sources that you have to apply it to? Those sources are the Quran and the Sunnah essentially. And then there are certain other sources as well, the Ijma of the Ummah and Qiyas and so on, but essentially it's the Quran and the Sunnah. This is here, the first difference between the Ahlul Sunnah and the Shia lies here, in terms of the source. Where do they draw from? Well, they also came to draw from the Quran. And next one, the Sunnah. Which Sunnah? You ask Ahlu Sunnah. You ask a Hanafi, a Shafi'i, a Maliki, a Hanbali. What is the Sunnah? Those are hadith that you find in Bukhari and Muslim and Tirmidhi and Abu Dawud. You ask a Shi'i, what's the Sunnah? Not Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi and Abu Dawud. It's going to be Al-Kafi. It's going to be Malla Yahdurhu al Faqih, a book like Tahdeeb al Ahkam, Al Istibsar. These are the sources which they have. Their Sunnah is completely different from ours. So that's the first line of difference already. So can they be on par just like all the other madhahib? When the source, is, the, first, the source is different, that's the one thing we need to look at. The second line of difference. There are three ways in which they are different from us. The one is the sources are different. Among the Ahlul Sunnah, Maliki, Shafi, Hanbali, Hanafi, everyone, same sources. Secondly, who is the one who draws from those sources? What kind of authority does the person who draws from those sources? Let's look at them. Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, and all the mujtahideen of their madhahib afterwards, all the fuqaha of their madhahib afterwards. Let's look at them. What are they? Are they infallible human beings? No, they are very fallible. They can make mistakes like everyone else. Yes, they have a capacity of fiqh. They have very, very well developed minds. They have insight into issues that you and I might not have. But they are not anbiya, nor are they superior to anbiya. They take the legacy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they draw from it for the benefit of the rest of us. They unpack the law from the sources. Does that mean that every iota of what they unpack from the sources is above question, is infallible? No. No madhab is infallible. Every madhab will have certain points where the other madhab is stronger. 
that mother be stronger than that our mother on this one, our mother be stronger than that one. Mother, he make mistakes. Imam Shafi'i rahmatullahi alayhi said that if you find my qawl on the one hand and you find the hadith on the other, take my qawl and throw it against the wall and go for the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Admission of the fact that he is fallible. Now we come to the Shia. If they speak about the Ja'fari madhab, Shafi'i madhab is Imam Shafi'i, Hanafi Abu Hanifa, Ja'fari madhab is who? Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. Now, you know what they say about Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. Those that were here for the past three weeks will know. Those that were not here, Ja'far al-Sadiq is higher than Musa, Isa, Ibrahim. He is infallible. The Anbiya, the Anbiya cannot come close to the status of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq is absolutely infallible. He is his status is like the status of the Anbiya and even more. When he draws from the sources, he, he doesn't draw from the source. He is the source. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa doesn't draw from a source. He is the source of the sunnah. To the Shia Imam Jafar doesn't draw from the source. He is the source himself. Is there any comparison between the former Dahib of the Ahlul Sunnah on the one hand and Imam Jafar al-Sadiq on the other hand? No, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq is something else. Out of this world, the Imams of the, of the Ahlul Sunnah are but uh, little children when compared to someone of such a high stature. So therefore there can be no comparison between these two here as well. And then, third point on why are there differences? And uh, 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 why can we not equate the madhab of the Shia as a Ja'fari madhab with the four madhahib? Because how do we account for differences in the other madhahib? Among the Ahlul Sunnah now, when I make salah somewhat differently to the others, when I say, Sami Allah, Uliman Hamid, and I raise my hands, when I say, Amin, loudly, and he says, Amin, softly, when I tie my hands on my chest, and he ties his hands below his navels, or he keeps it by his side, all these are variant forms, all of which come in the sunnah. And how do we account for them? How do we account for them? Do we say that, you know, Imam Abu Hanifa, uh, he forged things from his own side. He makes up his own sunnah. We don't, we don't ever say anything like that. He has a certain approach. There are a hadith which indicate that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa raised his hands. There are a hadith which indicates that he didn't raise his hands. What do we say? Abu Hanifa says, this is better to do. If you do the other, that's also fine. Imam Shafi says, this is better to do. You do the other, that's also fine. So how do they account for one another? They account for one another in the adoption of different kind of principles. They account for one another in the sense that within the sunnah you get variant forms. This is also right and that is also right. You can go on, on, on any of these two ones. So sometimes it's a matter of a different principle that's adopted. For example, a certain hadith. The hadith Mursal, for example. Imam Shafi says, you can't use it except if a number of other uh, factors are satisfied as well. Imam Abu Hanifa says, you can use it by all means. So obviously in a case like that, he's going to have a different point, uh, exit point. Imam Shafi is going to have a different one. But between the madhahib, there's never a finger pointed that that madhahib is the corruption of the haq. We are the haq alone, that madhahib is a corruption. No, there's never any such a thing. Therefore we will find that amongst our ulama, there are those, they might be Hanafis, they studied with Shafi'is, they might be Malikis, they studied under Hanbalis. It happens all the time. Because we are four rivers flowing out of the same, out of the same source. Exactly the same source. The differences are minimal. The differences are ones of either principle of interpretation or variation. When we come to the Shia, we ask them, why are you different from the rest? Why do you make salah on a stone and they don't make salah on a stone? Why do you have certain things in your fiqh which they don't have? They have a completely different way of accounting for this. How do they account for it? I mentioned once upon a time, the Shia have an absolutely different approach to Quran, they have an absolutely different approach to Sunnah, and they also have a very, very distinctly different approach to history. Their approach to history is one, in which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was living in Makkah with his family and a few very devoted followers. And they were living in a place where there's a lot of kuffar. Who are those kuffar? Two levels of kuffar. The first level of kuffar is Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab and everyone else. The other level of kuffar, don't go by the name of kuffar, they go by the name of munafiqeen. And their names were Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman. So you find Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Khadija, a few people in the co. Around them there are those who claim to be Muslim but they are not Muslim. These munafiqs. And around, the outside of them there is the entire sea of kuffar out there. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam makes hijrah. 
He makes Hijra, he comes to Medina. And those Munafiqeen who waited 13 years in Mecca, they wait another 10 years. The moment Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa passes away, they take over affairs of Islam. They make themselves the Khalifas. And now what do they start doing now? The Shia have a hadith which they quote from Imam Jafar al-Sadiq. And Allah knows that Imam Jafar al-Sadiq never would have said something like this. But these are the kind of things which they ascribe to the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt. They said that a person came to Imam Jafar al-Sadiq. A person comes to Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, and I'm quoting these things here, not from the books of some ancient Shia. Because we are sometimes told that don't quote from books, don't read what, you, don't believe everything that you get in a book. So you say, fine, whose books must we then read? Could there be a better representative of moderate Shiism than Ayatollah Khomeini? So we are quoting from Khomeini's own book. He's written a little book called At-Ta'adul wa tarjih And those who know the subject of Usul al-Fiqh, they will know that Ta'adul wa tarjih is one of the chapters within that subject. How do you reconcile differences? When there are differences in the sources, between different ahadith, how do you reconcile those sources? In there, Khomeini mentions a number of different principles. But it all boils down to two. One of which he expresses in the following way. Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, someone comes to him and asks him, you know, I live in a city. We have no Shia faqih there. We have no Shia alim. The only Sunni ulama there. We have only a small little group of Shia. Of, of Shia and there is no, no, no alim to guide us. Uh, and we can't come to Medina all the time to come ask you. We are living very, very far away. So how do we go about if we need the answer to any particular question? He says, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq tells him, you go to the Sunni alim of your city. Go to that Sunni alim and you ask him what's the answer. Whatever answer he gives you, do exactly the opposite. You must do exactly, and the person is as astonished as you are right now. Why exactly the opposite? Then he goes on to explain to him. He says that these people, these Sahaba, after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they left no stone unturned. Every little mas'ala they corrupted. Because it was their mission in life to corrupt, to thwart the mission of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Every little mas'ala they took, they changed here, they changed there, till you eventually get what they get of people making salah in this way, buying and selling in that way, making nikah in that particular way. Why? How do they account for the fiqh of the Ahlu Sunnah? They say this is the distortion, this is the corruption of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. And their madhab is what? The original way that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa left it with them. These are three reasons why we cannot simply dismiss the issue of the Shia and say it's just the fifth madhab along with the other madhab. First of all what? Their sources are different. Their hadith are completely different from ours. Second reason, the person to whom they ascribe themselves, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, is not just a normal mujtahid imam. He is a person who is higher than the anbiya. He is not a source. He is, he is not drawing from a source. He is the source. And the last one, how do they account for the fact that other madhahib exist? Well, you know, the Sahaba radiallahu anhu did all of these things. Therefore, you find all of these other madhahib coming about. There would be some of those who would go to the extent of telling you today that all Sunni madhahib come from the Shia. How does that come about? They say Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi once upon a time said, لَوْ لَسَّنَتَانِ لَهَلَكَ nuaman If it wasn't for those two years, an nuaman was Imam Abu Hanifa, that was his personal name. Nu'man would have been destroyed. Abu Hanifa would have been destroyed. So what does that mean? Then they give an interpretation. They say, Imam Abu Hanifa went for two years and studied with Imam Jafar al-Sadiq. It's during that time that he became an alim. Imam Jafar al-Sadiq made him what he was. So then they go, and then Imam Malik studied under Imam Abu Hanifa. Then Imam Shafi studied under Imam Malik. And Imam Ahmad studied under Imam Shafi. So the Shafi Madhab, Hanafi Madhab, Hanbali Madhab, Maliki Madhab, all of them come from the Shia. It might sound convincing to those who do not know. But Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi, his teacher was Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman, whose teacher was Alqama and Aswad ibn Yazid al nakhai whose teacher, sorry, Ibrahim al nakhai whose teachers were Alqama and Aswad ibn, Yaz- Aswad ibn Yazid, whose teacher was Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. The place where Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi used to teach in the Masjid of Kufa was the same spot that Imam uh, that Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud used to teach at. The fiqh of Imam Abu Hanifa is the fiqh of Ibrahim al nakhai is the fiqh of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. 
And as for the other madhahib, Imam Shafi'i rahmatullahi alayhi comes from Makkah, where he studied under Muslim Ibn Khalid as Zanji, who studied under Ibn Juraj, who studied under Ata, who studied under Ibn Abbas. Imam Malik comes from Medina, where he studied under his teachers, Rabi'a and others, who are the students of the seven fuqaha of Medina, who are the students of the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum. This is where these people studied. And this whole story of two years, where does it come from? First of all, there is no good historical source for did Imam Abu Hanifa ever say something of the kind. If he did say something of the kind, there is no mention in the story itself of Jafar al-Sadiq. Towards the end of his life, Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi, was asked, was almost forced by the Sultan, the, the Khalifa of the time to become the Qadi. He refused. They said, if we don't become the Qadi, we are going to throw you into jail. Then what did he do next? He fled from there. And he went to go live in Hijaz for a while. But you must look at it. Who is this Abu Hanifa? He is an alim of such a high stature that they wanted to make him the chief justice. He wasn't some unlettered little fellow that had to go to Medina and be taught by Imam Jafar al-Sadiq. He was already the great alim of his time. These are the kinds of issues, the kinds of, uh, 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 of statements that the Shia will use to attract the youngster of the Ahlu Sunnah. You say, all these Sunni madhahib come from us. You know, all your imams really studied under the imams of the Ahlul Bayt. That brings us to our... Probably the last topic for tonight. What is this thing of the link between the Shia and the Ahlul Bayt? They, you know, as I said, the foundation is called the Ahlul Bayt Foundation of South Africa. Much is made out of the fact that the Shia follow who? The Ahlul Bayt. Who are the Ahlul Bayt? They say these great Imams. From Ali and his wife Fatima, then there was Imam Hassan, then Imam Hussein, then Imam Zain al-Abidin, Imam Jahab, they say, we follow these people of the Ahlul Bayt. The first thing that we say to that is that, the Ahlul Bayt is much wider than just Ali, Hassan, Hussein and Fatima. In terms of the ayah which we read and discussed last week, the wise of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa a part and parcel of the Ahlul Bayt. Ahlul Bayt, people of the house, who live in the house? First of all, the wives. We find that saying Ahlul Bayt, that word, that applica- the, the, the description there of Ahlul Bayt, Allah Ta'ala applied it to Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam when he barely had any children. Rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu alaykum Ahlul Bayt innahu hamidun majid. And who was the Ahlul Bayt at that time? Say, Sayyidah Hajar and Ismail were already gone to Mecca. It was only Ibrahim and Sarah. And Ishaq wasn't even born because that was the time when they came to give the glad tidings that Ishaq will still be born. Only Ibrahim and his wife, Allah Ta'ala calls it the Ahlul Bayt. So first thing that we say about this is that the wives must be part of the Ahlul Bayt. Do the Shia follow the, uh, have respect even for the wives of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Some of them they claim to love. Not everyone. They have an exceptional hatred against Sayyida Ummul Mu'mineen Aisha radiyallahu anha and Ummul Mu'mineen Sayyida Hafsa radiyallahu anha. Why? Because this is the daughter of Abu Bakr and that's the daughter of Umar radiyallahu anhuma. In the Quran, there was a case, Surah An-Nur, Allah Ta'ala makes mention, when false accusations were brought against Sayyida Aisha radiyallahu anha, Allah Ta'ala did not leave it there. The munafiqeen in Medina were making false accusations against the chastity of our mother Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha. Allah Ta'ala did not leave it there. Surah An-Nur was revealed in which it was, it was made clear for each and every one, for all and sundry, that Aisha is the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-khabithatu lil-khabithin, wal-khabithuna lil-khabithat, wal-tayyibatu lil-tayyibin, wal-tayyibuna lil-tayyibat. Bad women for bad men. Bad men for bad women. Pure women for pure men. And who can be purer than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Therefore, who can be purer than the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Allah Ta'ala revealed these ayat of Surah An-Nur to defend Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha to make it clear to everyone that she is above any kind of question, any suspicion. That is, if you look at our books, the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, go to the Hadith books and the Tafsir books of the Shia. Go to the tafsir of Surah An-Nur and read those ayat and read what tafsir they give on it. They have a completely different take. I said many a times, they have a very different approach when it comes to the Quran, history and everything else. Listen to one of the forms in which history has been distorted to serve the purpose of the Shia. They say yes, there was an accusation that was made. But who was the one who made the accusation? Aisha was the one who made the accusation, they say. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, all of his children were born from 
Ummul Mu'minin Sayyidah Khadija, Khadija radiyallahu anhu, with the exception of one, Ibrahim, the son of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was born of Maria al qibtiya The Shia riwayat go on. The Shia hadith say that when Ibrahim was born, Aisha was so jealous because she couldn't give Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a child. But Maria gave him a child. So Aisha said, this child is not Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's child. And therefore Allah Ta'ala revealed these ayah to show that this Aisha is this evil woman who makes accusation against other wives. This is how interpretation of the Quran is distorted. Hadith is forged to serve the same purpose. And tafsir of the Quran becomes come something completely different to the Shia than what it is to the Ahlu Sunnah. No stone was left unturned. Even this case here where Allah Ta'ala spoke clearly. In defense of the virtue and chastity of Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha, they've changed. We come back, however, to the issue of who is the Ahlul Bayt. Now when we look, after Sayyidina al Hussein, who are their Imams? It's only the nine Imams thereafter. He's going to be the first one, Ali ibn Hussein Zain al-Abideen. Thereafter, Muhammad al-Baqir. Thereafter, Ja'far al-Sadiq. Thereafter, Musa al-Kadhim. Thereafter, Ali al-Ridha. Thereafter, Muhammad al-Jawad. Then Ali al-Hadi. Then Hassan al-Askari. And then the final 12 Imams who say went into hiding. When they speak about the Ahlul Bayt, they only speak about these figures whose names I've mentioned. 14 persons. Who are those 14 persons? The 12 Imams and Fatima radiallahu anha and her father sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the concept of Ahlul Bayt to them. What about all the other descendants of Sayyidina al-Hasan? Sayyidina Hassan ibn Ali. What about his descendants? Not Ahlul Bayt. Why not Ahlul Bayt? Because the descendants of Hassan ibn Ali are who? Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. They are not Shia. They are the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Where do you find them? All over the Muslim world. Go to Morocco. Go to Morocco, the rulers, the Idrisi rulers of Morocco were the children of Al-Hasan ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. Go elsewhere in the Muslim world, you will find scores and scores of descendants, hundreds of thousands of descendants from the line of Sayyidina Al-Hasan ibn Ali. What are they Shia? They are Ahlul Sunnah. So therefore they cannot be regarded as part of the Ahlul Bayt. And what about each of these Imams? We said only the, the, this particular line. Those Imams also had children. Those Imams there, those nine people from the line of Hussein. Let's say for example, Ali ibn Hussein, Zainul Abidin, The first son of Imam Hussein, who they say is their Imam. I told you the story some time ago of his son Zaid. See the Ahlul Bayt used to live in where? In Medina. They used to live in Medina, they didn't travel out. Until the time of Imam Muhammad al-Baqi, uh, up to Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. They did not travel, Musa al-Kadhim as well. They remain in Medina. They remain in Medina for a reason. They remain in Medina because twice in the history, they had been severely, severely disappointed, betrayed by the Shia themselves. The ones when the Shia of Kufa told Hussein, come to Kufa, we will support you. And when Hussein came, they did not support him. In fact, they turned against him. That was in the year 60 after the Hijrah. And then in the year 121, almost 60 years later, another similar event took place. Zaid ibn Zayn al-Abideen once again led a revolt against the Umayyads and 40,000 Shia of Kufa gave him their bay'ah. 40,000 people of Kufa said, we are following you. At the last moment, just before the jihad was supposed to start, they came to him and said, we've got a question to ask you. So what's your question? They said, we want to know, what's your opinion on Abu Bakr and Umar? He says, these two men were the ministers, the first prime ministers of my grandfather, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فَأَتَوَلَّاهُمَا وَلَا أَتَبَرَّأُ مِنْهُمَا I have nothing but good to say about them. I do not dissociate myself from these two persons, Abu Bakr and Umar. 40,000 Shia turned back on their heels. They say, if that is what you say, we will not support you. You are not our Imam. Zaid Ibn Ali ibn Hussein fought with 300 men only. 300 men and he became shaheed on that day. Who was he to betray him? These very same people who betrayed his grandfather before him. So therefore, the imams of the Ahlul Bayt used to restrict themselves to Medina. They did not travel. When Zaid traveled a bit and he, uh, he heard what people were saying about the Ahlul Bayt, he was astonished. He says, I never heard this from my father. You saying my father is an imam who teaches people that he's higher than the Anbiya and the Sahaba like this and those people are like that. My father never taught me this. So the Shia person who he was asking this question to, the person told him, you see, your father knew that if he was going to teach you these things, you would reject it. So he didn't teach you. So you are ignorant on the day of Qiyamah, you can tell, Ya Allah, my son didn't know, so please let him go to Jannah. This is the kind of statements that they make. Now, all those other children of the Ahlul Bayt, what do they say about them? A few years ago, we had a Bosnian alim here. 
um, and he uh, he visited us at the, at, at the MJC, and it was brought to his attention that the MJC, you know, um, they're not too friendly with the Shia. So he said, people, you know, the days, this, this times in which we live today, um, can we still sit and waste our time on issues like this? We need unity. We can't still sit and bicker about Shia and Ahl Sunnah and all of these things. So I told him, and by the way, he was a Husayni Sayyid as well. He was the descendant of Sayyid al-Husayn. So I had with me on that day, I just happened to have, have a copy of Al-Kafi with me. So I told him, you know, I take what you hear, what you say. It's very important. We must have this, this unity. And I also realize that you are descendant of Sayyidina Hussein ibn Ali. You are descendant of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But you are a Sunni. He says, yes, I'm a Sunni. So I asked him, please listen to this hadith from Al-Kafi. I'm reading to you from Al-Kafi and I read to him. The hadith from Al-Kafi says, any descendant of the Ahlul Bayt who is not a Shia, he's going to get double the punishment that you and I are going to get. So he says, I didn't know that. He says, I didn't know that. I say, well, there it is. It's for reasons such as these that we feel that the spread of Shiism in society such as ours here is going to be bad. But over and above that, the Shia claim to love the Ahlul Bayt, they only love 14 persons from the Ahlul Bayt. All the rest, the rest can go and go to Jahannam and get double the punishment that they deserve over there. Why? Because they don't follow this particular line of 14 persons. To round up, there's one other important issue that I still wish to bring up, but Sheikh has given me only one hour tonight. This one other important issue is that all these hadith which the Shia have in their books, all these hadith which they have, is this really the madhab of the Ahlul Bayt? You know, they fiqh when they make salah on the stone and they do all the other things. They do it because the imams instructed them. Those instructions of their imams, that's their hadith. That you'll find it in their books. The books which I mentioned before. Al-Kafi, Malla Yahdurul Faqeed, Tahdeeb, Istifsar. Are four of the main ones. There are many other ones as well. Are these really the things that the Ahlul Bayt said? Did Imam Jafar say all these kind of things? Did Imam Muhammad al-Baqir make these kind of statements? We the Ahlul Sunnah have a very difficult, very hard time accepting that the descendants of our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could ever say things of this nature. How do we account for it? We account for it in the following way. The Imams primarily, up to Jafar Sadiq Musa al-Kadhim, up to Imam Musa al-Kadhim, that's about seven, eight Imams out of the out of the twelve. They stayed only in Medina, and the followers where were the followers? Not in Medina. The followers were living in Iraq, hundreds of kilometers away, far away they were living. Now, what used to happen? Those followers used to come to Medina from time to time, and then they return from there. They come and tell everyone, you know what? The Imam said this. The Imam said that. The Imam said that. When they ascribed all of these things to these Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, when they said that Imam Jafar said this, or Imam Muhammad al-Baqir said that, or Imam Musa al-Kadhim said, how truthful were they? The question is, how truthful were they? You ask the Shia, they will say that they were extremely truthful. But you ask us, the Ahlul Sunnah, we will say there's something which makes us worried here. There's something which makes us worried. Let's just for a quick moment look at something. Shaykh Irfan is the imam of this masjid here. Let's assume we are living back in the Middle Ages, when there was no, uh, there, there was no modern communications. Now, people come to this masjid, they hear the imam of the masjid speaking. Let's say there are five fellows. Each one of these fellows is a confounded liar. Each one goes back to his little dorpi from the karu where he comes from. And they go there, and they go and con- they can say, you know, Shaykh Irfan said this, Shaykh Irfan said that. But they are lying. For our purposes right now, we are saying they are lying. My question to you would be this. Are they always going to be in agreement with one another or will they be conflicting? Will you have conflicting versions of what the Imam said here? Or will you have all of them saying the same thing? When the fact is that they are making it up. What will be the outcome? You'll f- will there be harmony between their versions or will there be conflict? Obviously there is going to be conflict. So then I ask you to go with me to the very first page of the book Tahdeebul Ahkam, one of the four major books of the Shia. On the very first page of that book, the author of the book, Abu Ja'far al-Tusi, he writes in there and he says that, ذَاكَرَنِي بَعْضُ أَصْحَابِنَا بِحَدِيثِنَا وَمَا وَقَعَ فِيهِ مِنَ الْإِخْتِلَافِ وَالتَّضَادِ وَالتَّبَايُنِ حَتَّى لَا يَكَادْ يَتَّفِقُ حَدِيثٌ إِلَّا وَبِإِزَائِهِ مَا يُضَادُّهُ 
ولا يكاد يسلم خبر الا وفي مقابله ما يخالفه he says that our hadith the reason why i'm writing this book he says because our hadith the hadith of the shia are as follows there is such a lot of internal contradiction in our hadith, he says, that you can barely find a single hadith that is not contradicted by another. Uh, is this the ilm of the Ahlul Bayt that the Shia base their madhab upon? Or is this the fanciful imagination of a group of people who thought it's okay to lie? You can make up things, just ascribe it to the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and it's fine, you know, as long as we are saying Imam Jafar said it, it'll move, it'll go, it'll sell, people will uh, adapt to it. They forge these ahadith, where sitting in Kufa, sitting in Qum, far away from the Imam, so much so when the Imams afterwards used to hear of the statements that people are ascribing to them, they would say that, لَعَنَ اللَّهُ زُرَارَ لَعَنَ اللَّهُ زُرَارَ لَعَنَ اللَّهُ زُرَارَ Zurara ibn A'yan is one of the most prolific narrators of the Shia. One of the most prolific narrators, he narrates several, several ahadith from the Imams of the Ahlul Bayti, one of the main narrators. When Imam Jafar Asari heard of the kind of things that he is ascribing to him, Imam Jafar said, May Allah curse Zurara. Three times he said, May Allah curse Zurara. You go to the Shia today, you say, ask him about Zurara. Say, oh, Zurara, very good narrator. One of those upon whom our hadith rests, they say. One of the pillars of narration. When we ask them, but what about the fact that Imam Jafar Asari cursed this person called Zurara? They said, you know, in those days it was very, very difficult. It was very difficult because if the government knew that Zurara was Imam Jafar's man, they would have given him a hard time. The special branch would have paid him a visit or something like that. So Imam Jafar cursed him just so people mustn't think this is my man. He cursed him just so people must think, ah, he's just one of those, Imam Jafar cursed him. Imam Jafar cursed him, they have a cover-up story for that as well. And these are the people. This kind of person called Zurara ibn Ayan, The kind of person called Abu Basir al-Muradi. Uh, and a number of others, these are the peace people upon whose integrity the hadith of the Shia rest. It is these people who ascribe words to the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt. I leave you with a final thought. The final thought is that once upon a time there was a Rasul. His name was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He had a group of people around them. They are called the Sahaba, they are called the Muhajiruna, they are called the Ansar. The Shia have a very big problem with these people. They say these people are the ones who lied, and who forged, and falsely ascribe a hadith to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa They say a chap like Abu Huraira, how can a fellow who only stayed two years in the company of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa narrate over 5,000 a hadith? What they don't tell you, is they have a rawi, he's called Jabir ibn Yazid al-Ju'afi. This particular person, claims to narrate, not 5,000, not 10,000, 30,000 a hadith from your Muhammad al-Baqir alone. Then they say, these are the people who narrate a hadith. These are the people who preserve the legacy of the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What is this legacy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Is it all these hadith that we have in the books of the Ahlul Sunnah, which are rigorously submitted to a process of criticism, before we can say this hadith is sahih? Where a person like Imam Bukhari, rahmatullahi alayhi, who take 15 to 20 years, Checking each hadith scrupulously before he puts it in the book of his. Because things cannot just be ascribed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam just because you feel it must be done. Where this process of authentication is going on right up to the present day. On the other hand we have the Shia ascribe things to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if it happens to contradict one another, the Shia have a very very unique explanation as well. When they are asked, how come your hadith are so contradictory? They have an answer. This book that I was quoting from Tahdeeb al uh, and its shortened version, al istibsar fi Makhtalaf ibn al-Akhbar, they have very unique ways of explaining the differences. They say, you see, if you have two hadith, the imam says this and the imam says that. You must understand, on day one when the imam said this, then there was a Sunni present in the gathering. So the imam, you laugh, it's true, really. It, the, there was a Sunni present, so the imam made taqiyya. The Imam made taqiyya and stated it in line with the Ahlul Sunnah, just so that Sunni mustn't get wrong ideas and run to the government. But on the second day, there were only Shia present, therefore he gave it as it is supposed to have been. There is a four-volume book, each volume consisting of 500-odd pages, 
saying things of this nature here. That four volume book is the smallest of the four books of the Shia. That book is devoted to explaining away these differences. Now these differences are the kind of things that they won't teach you when you go to the vet road. These are the things that the Shia won't be telling you, either because they are unaware of it, or because if they are aware of it, it doesn't make good sense to put issues of this nature in front of a public. It doesn't make for very, very good propagation or propaganda. Therefore, it won't be said. Our mission here is to look at those things, not to shy away from it, and then to tell our Shia friends on the other side of the divide, you have a lot of internal dialogue to do. You have a lot of things to come to terms with. Once you come to, ter- you come to terms with those issues there, once you have sorted out your internal house, then you might come to us and we might have dialogue. But while your house is in the kind of disarray that it is, while your madhab rests upon the transmission of liars, whom the imams of the Ahlul Bayt themselves cursed publicly several times, as long as you go on with that, I think you have got very little right, what, uh, or you have no right whatsoever to come to us, the Ahlul Sunnah, and tell us and our children, you must convert to the madhab of the Ahlul Bayt. Why? Because it's not the madhab of the Ahlul Bayt. Whose madhab is it? It's the madhab of those people who claim to be the followers of the Ahlul Bayt. And who cursed them? The Ahlul Bayt, the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, themselves cursed these people. Where? Not in Sunni books, in the books of the Shia themselves. To cover up for it, they have... The most ludicrous kind of stories, but this is what Shiism is all about. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا أَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِ Shiism is all about. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا أَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِ